Hello and welcome to the National Security Conversation. Last night, the Indian Space Research Organization, ISRO, made its maiden attempt at landing the lunar probe called Vikram on the moon, even though finally it did not take place due to some technical difficulties. The mission, however, is not a total failure as the lunar probe will continue to carry out its mission from the space. Earlier this year in March, the Indian government tested its first anti-satellite weapon becoming part of a select group of countries that have this technology. Space is a key element in India's national security policy and therefore a coherent, robust policy around space is essential to India's interests. We must, however, have a space policy uh, while proactively engaging the debate about the militarization of space and its negative consequences. To discuss these issues, I have with me Dr. Rajeshwari Pillai Rajagopalan. Rajeshwari Pillai Rajagopalan is a distinguished fellow and uh, head of the Nuclear and Space Policy Initiative at the New Delhi-based Observer Research Foundation. Dr. Rajagopalan joined ORF after a five-year stint with the Government of India at the National Security Council Secretariat. She is the author of several interesting books, the latest being Nuclear Security in India, published in 2015. Dr. Rajagopalan is an authority on all issues space. Welcome to the NSC, Dr. Rajagopalan. Thank you. Thanks. Um, it's, it's been a long time in the making, but I think finally we are here. Thank you. Thank you for making it finally. <laughs> Rajeshwari, if I may begin by asking you about what you uh, thought about the attempted landing of the lunar probe on the moon last night um, and the journey of India's space program through the decades. Let me start with the last year, last night's uh, event in a sense or rather early morning, uh, the Chandrayaan-2 mission. It's been an important mission for India. Uh, the, we did undertake the first Chandrayaan mission, Chandrayaan-1, in 2008. Uh, and since then, we were to have done the second uh, mission a few years later. Uh, but then we ran into some troubles uh, because we were initially relying on Russia for supplying us with the rover. Uh, Russians initially delayed and then finally called off. Um, so finally, the ISRO developed the entire mission indigenously. And I think that's something that is particularly impressive about the Chandrayaan-2 mission. It is a completely indigenous, uh, all the payloads, all the various component systems that have been completely made within. Um, having said that, I think this is, uh, this was going to be a tough mission, a very complex mission that many countries have not done so far. You have a con uh, three countries so far undertaken successful missions, uh, soft landing or crewed missions are the US, Russia and China. Uh, even China that has developed fairly uh, somewhat more uh, sophisticated space capabilities in certain niche areas, they had a successful landing on the moon, a uh, soft landing on the near side of the moon three years ago. So, their first attempt actually was on the near side of the moon which is much easier than on the far side of the moon or the southern polar region which we were attempting because you do not, these are completely unmapped areas of the lunar surface and that, that means it is that much more challenging. So, the two things, first this was the first attempt of India to do a landing, soft landing on a non-terrestrial surface. That is the first challenge. Second, we were doing it on a uh, landing on a place that is completely unmapped, uncharted in a sense so far. So, that made it even more challenging. Second, third, of course, I think there are several different technical issues that come into play. Uh, we do not know what exactly happened. ISRO is yet to make a statement on the uh, technical glitches that uh, they had so close to the actual landing. Uh, they reached up to the height of about 2.1 kil uh, kilometers. But the, if you remember, a few months ago, you had the Israeli. Uh, private uh, uh, spa uh, space industry uh, which undertook such a mission, they crash landed. They were 151 meters from the landing uh, altitude kind of thing. So, mission landings of this kind are extremely challenging. When you look at global success rates, it is something less than 50 percent. Uh, some say that it is about 41 percent, some others say it is about 37. So, certainly less than 10, uh, 50 percent is the uh, success rate of any of this kind of uh, soft landing of, on moon or other surfaces. Um, so, 
but I think that still I do not think we should uh, lose hope. This is not uh, anything to say that uh, India has a weak space program or anything of that kind. This whatever we have achieved irrespective of the result, I think it is a fairly um, fair amount of achievement that we have done so far. There is one important aspect of this which is the orbiter because most of the people have focused on the lander and the rover because that is the uh, core aspect of the Chandrayaan 2 mission. But the orbiter that is going to be live for the next one year plus has important functions as well. Uh, it is going to be conducting a lot of experiments, it has a huge number of scientific payloads uh, plus it is going to collect data and as well as imagery and send them back to earth in a sense. So, uh, this mission uh, despite the fact that it is has, has had a setback, it is still important in terms of our ability to understand the lunar surface and so on and so forth. Um, on the larger journey, I think uh, for instance uh, for uh, the first several decades, we were not focused on interplanetary missions like Mangalyaan or Chandrayaan and moon missions were not part of the uh, Indian ambitions or Indian goals when we started the space program. Uh, our sole focus for the longest time was to develop uh, space technology for social and economic upliftment of the people uh, change because given the vast geography of the country you need for instance communication channels to be excellent. Uh, you also uh, have to deal with issues of uh, education, health and so on and so forth. So, the telemedicine, teleeducation all of these initiatives that have been using space components, space assets uh, that is a remarkable thing and in, in fact many countries developing countries are looking at the Indian role model and India as a role model to see India has been a developing country that has developed these, con these capabilities to uh, further their socio-economic and development goals and this is something that they see that uh, emulating in us in some sense. So, uh, but in more recent times maybe a decade and a half things are changing even within the Asian space, uh, uh, space landscape as well. What are some of the shortcomings in the Indian uh, space industry uh, as it were? You, you talked about the rover um, that the Russians refused to sell to India. Um, uh, why, why did they refuse to do that and uh, why have uh, why have we not been able to sort of get to that get to that stage? No, I think uh, no, we finally built it on our own but the fact is that initially we thought that uh, many of these missions were also going to be part of a you know international collaboration. So, even for Chandrayaan 1 for instance, uh, we uh, relied on the NASA, the US uh, space agency to give us the deep space communication networks and assistance in that regard. Um, so, it is it's not some when you undertake some of these larger missions like this, it is it contributes to the humanities understanding of the lunar surface or uh, Mangalyan and Mars and so on and so forth. So, it is seen as uh, a, an ideal area for collaboration between uh, your international partners and that is why we uh, thought we would uh, get the rover from Russia. But I believe there was a China factor that came into play and that is why the Russians uh, went uh, kind of slow on the rover and finally said it was not going to happen. Uh, so, the China factor, so uh, China factor I think that is something that we need to keep in mind especially as uh, space becomes a lot more contested and security oriented in a sense. And now that uh, space is beginning to have uh, important consequences in the national security domain, I think we need to be extremely careful of uh, partners who we collaborate with in a sense and I think uh, that is something um, we have to be watchful of. How important is space diplomacy in the larger context of foreign policy and diplomacy as it were? And, and you mentioned China, um, India launched the South Asian satellite in 2017, takers in the region are not too many. Uh, is, China is, a is China a factor there? Oh, absolutely. China is a big factor. For instance, when first uh, when Modi, Prime Minister Modi announced the satellite, it was called the SAC satellite. Uh, then we moved on to rename it uh, because Pakistan did not want to be part of it and it took, took a quite a while to get that going in a sense in terms of uh, developing your uh, cooperation agreements with the neighbors uh, whether it is Bangladesh, Nepal and so on and so forth, Bhutan and so on and so forth. Uh, first there was some bit of a uh, um, uh, back and forth whether India would actually uh, build uh, the ground station and uh, such other infrastructure or those countries where have to uh, do it on their own and kind of thing. So, finally a lot of those issues have been resolved and the South Asian satellite has been put into place. But I think this has been um, we should have done this like decades ago because being a one of the major spacefaring powers, our neighborhood should have been taken care of by us in a sense. We should have reached out to them 
uh, instead of beginning to respond when China does something in a sense. China for instance a few years ago launched a satellite for Pakistan and then also for Sri Lanka. So in a sense instead of reacting to ch what China is doing and therefore reaching out, anyway I am glad that we have at least begun that path of uh, making space as an important element of our uh, diplomatic outreach. Uh, hopefully, that will pay uh, dividend, uh, dividends in the coming years. If I may probe, uh, probe, probe that a little more, how, how robust, how fierce is the space competition in the neighborhood between India and China? It is, uh, um, I, I, I do not want to say that we are competing with them for one for one and especially in our back, in the backyard, I do not think the, we have done too well. And so I will not compete uh, in that sense. And uh, China has made, of course, significant assistance, given assistance to Pakistan uh, and uh, whatever in terms of uh, the navigation networks, communication, whatever the Pakistan uh, Pakistan needs, uh, it is at their disposal from China. Um, so that's not something that they have to worry about. Uh, we haven't created that large a network of uh, assistance to our neighborhood. But although uh, during the recent visit of Prime Minister Modi to Bhutan, we uh, um, sort of uh, inaugurated the ground station there. So that's a major thing. Uh, we have had some of the largest uh, ground station setups uh, establishments in the Southeast Asian context. Uh, Vietnam hosts one of those such stations, Brunei and whole lot of. So we are beginning to see that space um, uh, outreach has to become. Uh, assume a larger proportion of our diplomatic outreach and so it's we are beginning to see that but I think we are still uh, have a lot of catching up to do and if you were to compare with China. You know India is India is developing a regional satellite navigation system how how significant uh, that is for India's national security uh, purposes. So this is a much um, smaller system as compared of course it's a it's something like that and uh, the US GPS network but it's a much smaller network. Uh, where we focus around 1500 kilometers around India's neighborhood. Um, so it's primarily looking at India's immediate backyard, the Indian Ocean region in a sense. Uh, but uh, many of the systems are, uh, the system in, is not fully operational for actually want of receivers because even though we launch the seven satellites now, the satellites are all in constellation, it's there, but we haven't had thought about the receivers to get the data. So the receivers, even though the satellites are already r up and running, the receivers were not ready. Is it because of the military implications of this? No, I don't think so. I don't think we paid as much of attention to that part of it um, when we were conceiving this whole GPS kind of thing. And finally, we have, I believe, more or less things in ready. Uh, there's a firm in ba Bangalore that has manufactured the receivers. But I believe we have, uh, we have this report is still to be confirmed. But I believe we have the chip in the receivers that were actually China and China made. Um, so the implications for national security is something exciting to think about. Um, so I think that so the, we need to think about these things in a holistic manner and the kind of development. It cannot be uh, compartmentalized between different departments and so on and so forth. We need to, and I think some of the institutionalized uh, integration is beginning to take place now that well, we have the DSA, the Defense Space Agency, which is. Uh, a front runner of a full fledged aerospace command that we would have hopefully in the next few years. Uh, but the Defense Space Agency itself would, I'm, I am hoping, that would integrate a lot of the different functions in terms of the security and military implications, what are those kind, kind of uh, technologies required, what are the kind of services required to uh, meet the growing uh, military and security requirements. This regional navigation, satellite navigation system or NAVIC, um, what implications does it have for the neighboring countries? I understand India's, the utility that India gains from it, but what, what implications, positive and negative, that it has, say from a neighbor's point of view? I, I, I do not think the countries are as concerned or there have been serious implications really conceived by the, uh, thought through by the uh, neighboring countries as of now. Uh, at best, uh, in a typical sense, Pakistan could raise some uh, concerns and say this is going to, uh, this is going to, uh, you know, dilute our own security problems, and we might have security concerns uh, coming out of because India might have a better uh, ability to kind of monitor things and so on and so forth. Uh, but I don't think uh, there is very much on the real uh, um, um, sort of concerns about India's NAVIC program, at least in the neighborhood. Typical response is going to be from Pakistan in that sense, uh, how it might impact on its own kind of, uh, how it might create more vulnerabilities on the part of for Pakistan.
What, what are some of the avenues for cooperation regionally and internationally in the context of India's uh, space diplomacy or space policy as it were? I think uh, two areas that uh, immediately come to mind. One is of course the imaging uh, remote sensing capabilities that are, in, 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 are required in a big way. Uh, especially when you look at the South and Southeast Asia region in a sense, especially with India having a look east and act east uh, diplomacy uh, towards South and Southeast Asian region in a big way. Uh, that focus, especially this region is also uh, very prone to natural disasters on a fairly frequent basis. So, the ability to uh, predict weather, uh, to keep a watch on the kind of uh, uh, weather patterns that exist in this area and the ability to mitigate some of the disaster management, uh, di disaster related issues. I think that be something that then of course is the communication networks that India might be able to offer other countries certain uh, certain capabilities, certain assistance in developing their capabilities but also provide the um, uh, give them the assistance in terms of the services not necessarily the satellite development itself but provide the services to these countries as well. Um, so, one in terms of your ability to watch out for the natural disasters, so weather forecasting becomes an important aspect of your, your assistance and that translates also to disaster management, disaster mitigation and so on and so forth and the second is in terms of the communications. You know, when, when one looks at the international discussions on space in general, one gets the feeling that the global space policy is still in sort of a flux, it's sort of still developing. Is, is that the case? I mean, you go for so many, I mean, I, I've seen you personally, you go for so many of these conferences, you, you uh, I mean, as a, as a private individual, you seem to be the Indian voice in many of these forums. What happens in these forums? What, 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 so, what are the discussions about? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, I think uh, there are a couple of different things that are happening. One is uh, in ter terms of developing and uh, furthering civil space cooperation because many countries around the world especially the developing countries in Africa, Latin America are just beginning to kind of appreciate the role that space can play in changing the, the lives of the people. Um, so, these countries are now looking at India. For instance, when India did the um, Mangalyan mission, it raised the profile of India as a whole but also raised the profile of the Indian space program and showed that India is a capable space power that can deliver uh, credible missions in a cost effective manner. So, it did not have an immediate directly direct economic benefit, but the fact is that it raised the profile of India. Now, many more countries are reaching out to India for land, uh, launching their satellites for instance. So, it has an Im Im uh, sort of indirect uh, way of you know strengthening India's profile, but also the economic revenue and so on and so forth. That's one. That is one part. The other important aspect is the kind of security related conversation that are beginning to take place. I was uh, part of the uh, most uh, recent UN group of governmental experts uh, which was constituted to look at the PARO's prevention of arms race in outer space. Um, that is come about because recognizing the uh, increasingly contested nature of space security, space uh, outer space environment and the kind of activities states are engaged in. So, um, after a two decade long moratorium that existed on uh, uh, on anti-satellite tests for instance, the last test was done in the 80s and the first in, in the in the earlier decades when you look at it, it, the last of the tests was done by the US sometime in 83. After that, the, there existed an unwritten thing that we no country is going to be conducting this ASAT test. Then came China's first successful ASAT test. Uh, in January 2007, that sparked a renewed interest in developing some of these uh, capabilities as well as the increasing focus on space security. I am not saying that we moved away completely from civil space cooperation and civil space agenda driving the… Uh, what do we mean by sp is, uh, space security? So, increasing number of… So, how does ASATs complicate uh, issues for instance? Uh, if I think that I need an anti-satellite capability to protect my assets, if I think it is good for me, other countries are going to be able to justify as well. So, countries can go down that path of thinking that they are developing effective deterrence mechanisms to prevent other countries from uh, um, or remove certain vulnerabilities in a sense. So, um, then of course, in 2008, um, the US did a anti-satellite test as well to show that we are still in business, we still have the capability. Within the Indian context, there was a new debate from, uh, from since uh, 2007 as to how India should respond to this capability, uh, how India should protect its own assets, what kind of deterrence mechanism. So, there was across the board political leadership, Indian Air Force military leadership, but also the technocrats actually came out and said we need to have something to protect our own assets because we have even a financial stake at 
the kind of investment that we have made, we have a financial stake in what goes on there. And uh, since then, there has been this idea whether India should demonstrate a capability or should simulate an anti-satellite capability and so on and so forth. Finally, earlier this year, we come out conducted. So, this was just, to, I think the primary thing was to send a message to China. That is, if you mess around with our satellite, we do have the capability to do precisely the same well, thing. Well, let us come to the anti-satellite test in, in a minute, but tell me yeah. something more about the kind of discussions that are going on. The other one is the civilian you mentioned, so, the other is the security of space. Uh, what are yeah. some of the other? So, the other other important uh, developments that are taking place is not just an, you do not have to have an ASAT capability because that also creates a huge amount of space debris. Right. Um, so, states are moving away in some sense from an anti-satellite capability to something more exciting and much cheaper to develop that is cyber and electronic warfare capabilities. And both of all of these capabilities are very easy to buy off the shelf online in fact. If you want some jamming uh, technologies, uh, these are things that you can buy it online for a couple of hundred um, bucks, you can actually get them. Um, so, these are and these are in a sense countries who might engage in such activities can also take the refuge and say we did not do it. Uh, it's, it's not, it, it may have been a, our country a national, but uh, we did not, there was no state support to that. So, it provides them quite a bit of cushion to say that you know take a, uh, take a uh, step back and say this is not our, our act and, and so how do you respond to these actions. So, so far in a sense there have been a number of incidents, but these have been in more in terms of teasing out the capabilities. Um, China has for instance uh, uh, tested these capabilities mostly almost completely against the US satellites so far in the last uh, at least since 2008 I can I can remember that. So, it is uh, more than a decade that they have been trying to test out these capabilities to see and also to send the message to across to, uh, to the US that we have the capacity, we have the capacity to inflict. So, these may not create permanent destruction of a satellite these do create temporary disruption to a satellite service for instance and so on and so forth, whether it is using lasers, microwave bombarding or the um, cyber mechanisms to um, interfere with your command and control systems, your logistic networks and this will come into particularly uh, play in a, um, in a uh, potential conflict scenario in Asia Pacific, Indo-Pacific for instance and that is a scenario I think China would actually uh, operationalize in full terms and interfere with a possible US satellite. Right, the the uh, March anti-satellite uh, test, the Mission Shakti. Yeah. What are the implications of that for India? Because the 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 range of the satellite that was shot down was about 300, 300 kilometers into space, yeah. whereas most of the uh, important satellites are way above yeah. that. So, yeah. how significant do you think Mission Shakti, Shakti was in in sort of uh, uh, making India's and the uh, uh, BMD capability more robust as it were? So, let us not confuse the BMD ASAT in a sense because I think the here we had a limited objective of showing that demonstrating the fact that we can engage in an anti-satellite and I am glad that we did it only at an altitude of 285 to 90 altitude uh, kilometer altitude because. Was that by intention or, by, or by that was, what was the limit of capability? Uh, by intention because uh, for instance in 2008 that uh, the US anti-satellite test was at about two, uh, 275 kilometer altitude because the long the Chinese anti-satellite tests in contrast they did it on a higher altitude creating much longer lasting debris at the higher altitude means you have those debris hanging around for decades together. So, in a sense that is going to be a much more irresponsible act and therefore, that is where I think having people like Dr. V. K. Saraswat as part of the Niti Aayog would have advised or suggested that we do this anti-satellite test demonstration at a lower altitude so that we do not create long lasting debris. So, you are saying that the, the capability to strike a um, satellite say at 5000 kilometers or 10000 kilometers. That would have created huge. Does that exist? That is a question. In that the Indian context, so are we? Uh, or is that a or is that a project still in uh, under development? Given our long term, uh, longer range uh, missile capabilities and kind of things, as well as uh, BMD capabilities that are still in the developing in the right. developing phases, I think that's something we should be able to. I uh, we haven't demonstrated, of course, but I think that's something we can uh, should be uh, should be require in the future. But the manner in which we did it, I think that was very considered very responsible. Uh, otherwise, imagine the reaction that would have come from the uh, from all the different players. But also, you are contributing to that space debris, space junk out there. And today, that is a major problem. A few years ago, we brought out a book, an edited book in ORF. Uh, one of the colleagues who wrote the chapter was from um, Ecuador, the space head of the space agency. Uh, 
his chapter title was it happened to us and he was happening to the event where their one and only satellite they had launched was lost to a anti satellite uh, to a space debris junk essentially so and they lost communication with the their satellites because it was a uh, satellite launched by Russia hit by a Chinese anti-satellite piece. So the space debris is, is already a huge problem and therefore um, it was important for us to demonstrate this capability but to demonstrate it in a responsible manner so that uh, the debris that we create at the end of the um, whatever piece, number of pieces that we created do not stay over there for you know two years together. Yeah, but if, if you are if you are on that trajectory of establishing an anti-satellite capability, a robust anti-satellite capability, then these tests will have to be undertaken. I mean, the, the developing countries, countries like Soviet Union and yeah. the United States did this in the 1960s. So, it is not as if uh, the, the late comers cannot. Yeah. No, I agree with that. And this is in, a, in that sense a very similar to the climate change uh, discourse in a sense of uh, who will create the, uh, who has created this junk and now whose, whose responsibility is to clean up the junk and so on and so forth. But I think uh, when the primarily we are trying to send a message to China, we do not need to really demonstrate that this in a, at a higher altitude, the message has gone to China that we have the capacity. And in fact, uh, after this, the DRDO also came out saying that we will go on to also develop some of these cyber and other counter space capabilities, cyber and electronic. So, I think the message is, is pretty loud and clear that to China, if you mess around, we will do the same to you. But there is a linkage between BMT capability and anti satellite capability in a broader sense yes, of the term, absolutely. right? Absolutely, yeah, that is right. Um, that, but that is, I think, uh, the, there are a lot of iffy uh, in a questions about the India's uh, BMD capability because we also yeah. now buy. Uh, uh, sometimes we it's want to partner with, exactly. We want to partner with other countries like Australia or the US and so on and so forth. Then we go on to buy their 400 systems and so on. So it is not absolutely clear how and uh, how credible. Uh, the Indian plans are about its missile defense program and where we are in terms of developing a full-fledged uh, system asset and how long it's going to take. What does the Outer Space Treaty expect countries to do or not to so do? So, the Outer Space Treaty is a fairly comprehensive one, uh, but it was particularly suited to the kind of threats that was, uh, this was came out in 1967. So, it is catered to uh, deal with threats of the time in a sense. So, one of the primary things is that it does not talk, it, it talks about non-placement of WMT, okay. it does not talk about non-placement of conventional weapons or any sort of weapons. But my point is that no sane country is going to put actually weapons in outer space today and you do not need to. High energy you lasers? Can, exactly, you can, high energy laser could be used as you a You could weapon. use them, but you can use anti-satellites or any other ways of doing it, you do not have to necessarily place them. Just um, some of the weapon systems transiting through the outer space, it is not very clear mm -hmm. through outer space, does that mean placement yeah. and so on and so forth. Second bigger debates in many of these platforms that I um, go to in multilateral forums is how do you define space weapon. Anything that goes up in space can be used today as uh, in a counter space manner. Is in that also not the debate between uh, militarization of space and weaponization That is also the other aspect, exactly. Militarization is something that states have come to accept including countries like India because most militaries around the world today use uh, space assets for a number of what we call the passive military applications which are the ISR, uh, intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance and so on and so forth. Uh, but the trend towards weaponization is what everybody is worried about but at the same time nobody wants to uh, come up with uh, clear measures to prevent them because we, one everybody gets stuck at how do you define a space weapon. If you are trying to prevent weaponization, what is weaponization? What do you consider as a space weapon? Uh, so, so some of the some of us have argued, saying that now you can't essentially anything that goes up can be used in a nefarious fashion. Then you have to go by the intent or the behavior of that particular intent is also kind of somewhat uh, shaky in a sense. Exactly. The behavior and the net result of a particular action in a sense. So, for instance, uh, many of the capabilities now uh, developed in the civil space which is to clean up space debris. There are new technologies being developed so that you can, some countries are developing a net sort of thing to collect all this junk. Somebody else is developing a laser technology. Uh, the Chinese have developed a robotic arm 
So all of these are purposely um, uh, uh, apparently for cleaning up the junk, removing the uh, this and so on and so forth. But how do you know that w if you are able to maneuver a particular piece in object in outer space, how do you know that tomorrow it is not going to be used to maneuver a, 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 my satellite tomorrow during a conflict. So there are those worries and we have not even debated begun the legal and the regulatory aspects of these new technologies in a sense because none of these new technologies are also proven as yet. NASA is developing certain capabilities, um, Chinese are developing certain capabilities, Japanese are doing something, Australians are doing something, uh, you, some certain European companies are developing certain, but none of these capabilities are proven as yet and therefore we have not even begun the process of debating the regulatory side of how do you put these uh, technologies to use in a sense. So, the outer space treaty is at this point of time not a very useful treaty. Yeah, and uh, so the outer space next? treaty and the next uh, there are four subsidiary agreements, none of them can actually deal with the threats of the day to day. Um, so, that is a major lack of Do you want to uh, describe that a bit, I mean very briefly? So, one is the for instance the uh, outer space treaty uh, deals with all of the different aspects. So, one is the liability convention. Liability is suppose I um, uh, run into your satellite or my, my space uh, debris goes and attacks, uh, um, destroys your satellite, who is liable for that particular damage created. So far no country has actually operationalized some of these many of these conventions in Canada. Then there is a registration convention that when you want to put up something in outer space, you register at the UN office of outer space affairs giving full sp details about what that satellite is meant to be. Uh, uh, and what are the purposes, what are the responsibilities, which orbit you are going to be launching that on and so on and so forth. But over, uh, over the last uh, several decades, it has been seen that the amount of information that is provided is not complete. So, most times states would just provide basic, very, very basic details in terms of providing the name of the satellite and so on and so forth, but nothing more than that. Um, so, the amount of information the or the lack of information on countries um, uh, assets, space assets is also contributing to the suspicion, oh I do not know what your particular that particular satellite, I am not clear of the intentions of uh, behind the satellite. Um, but at the same time if you are able to provide greater amount of information as required by the UNOSA, uh, it might actually lead to you know more uh, transparency and better confidence building measure and so on and so forth. Uh, so, that is uh, that is a problem. So, you have the registration convention, you have the liability convention and rescue agreement and so on and so forth. If one so, of these are some of the uh, new debates as part of the outer space So, these treaty. are all the old ones, these okay. are still part of the old ones. The new right, ones… But, uh, are, are some, there still discussions going on about these? Uh, so, in terms of your uh, inability to have full information on a satellite and so on and so forth, some of these old agreements are brought up again to um, strengthen the uh, full implementation of those. But the, some of the newer uh, sort of uh, recent discussions uh, to the few years ago you had another UNGGE that is a group of government experts on transparency and confidence building measures. Given that the major power politics today is impinging so negatively on the ability to come up with effective global rules of the road, uh, global governance mechanisms, countries are essentially thinking about at least talk about building greater confidence between each other. And that is by voluntarily talking about your space launches, inviting other space uh, space players to your launch pads and so on and so forth. Something like the nuclear security summit. <laughs> yeah, some bit, uh, so something along those lines, but to, in order to create a more uh, openness and transparency that itself remove possibly some of the uh, political um, sort of ambiguities in states intentions and so on and so forth. Uh, but at least in 2013 when they had this. Uh, transparency and confidence building measures GG, they were able to the 15 member countries were able to develop a consensus based report. But 2018-19 the GG on PAROS prevention of arms race in outer space, there was no consensus and therefore no report at the end of the GG proceedings of one year. That speaks to about the contentious nature of great power politics today and how that has come to hamper any effective way of dealing with outer space security or otherwise. And one other important aspect, space security arms control issues are typically um, debated at the conference on disarmament in Geneva, which has remained stalemated for more than two decades. So, essentially um, there is to the point that there is not even a, an agreement on the agenda plan of action in a sense within the CD. So, given the CD's stalemated nature of functioning what are you going to be doing, how are you going to, so are you waiting for a major catastrophe to happen and then that would wake up the uh, states 
their responsibility to do something serious about the global governance? I am not too sure because the, you are not seeing work on many countries do not want to sign on to a legally binding mechanism because there are certain states which might who might sign on to uh, these legally binding agreements and flout the rules. We have seen them in the past and therefore, many countries are uh, apprehensive about signing legally binding mechanisms and therefore, they suggest that maybe we should go for political agreements. So, that it builds the confidence in each other first and foremost, greater transparency. Yeah, but even if, you, if you if you even if you sign a, a treaty, if there is no verification mechanism, if there is no treaty organization. But how are you going to verify something on space? It is easier to, uh, uh, for yeah. instance, for instance, India has insisted for a very long time that India supports a legally binding mechanism with verification mechanisms, uh, clauses and so on and so forth. But verifying something in outer space activity, unless something somebody shoots off something, you are never going to know that somebody is doing something as long as somebody is doing a research on suppose I get some civil space technologies to develop a, you know my um, economic and social development aspects and so on and so forth. I am now diverting some of those capabilities civil space technologies to develop military space program until and unless I test some of those technologies nobody is going to know. But no, that is one. No harm in having that in, in the agreement as, as for, for a verification, the possibility of a verification. Yeah, people have talked about it. but I, I think the organization perhaps. Yeah, uh, yeah you, ca you can talk about it, you can mention that, but again that has also been a point of contention between states in a sense. Um, or states can also divert capabilities for ballistic missile program. So, forget about military space even go uh, a step further to develop a ballistic missile program. So, there are different ways of, uh, so that is why some of us again argue that you know there has to be some sort of, um, uh, so the global governance also have to do something with, uh, uh, about the civil space cooperation. I am not saying that it should be hampering. Uh, and therefore, not an NPT like mechanism, but something like this uh, chemical weapons convention, because space is a dual use um, object, uh, dual use capability, and therefore, it has to facilitate, but facilitate cooperation with certain uh, rules and regulations that would, so that it, you know, uh, the end result is kept track of, you can monitor the end use that is put to use and so on and so forth. So, in other words, the uh, Outer Space Treaty and its various conventions and the uh, PAROs, uh, the negotiations around PAROs, they are perhaps not enough at this point of time to address the emerging challenges in the field of, in, in the yeah. space, in the domain of space. Yeah. Have I understood that right? Absolutely. And in fact, PAROs, year after year, the, uh, we have uh, General Assembly um, resolutions and so on and so forth, but it is more than two decades, three decades now, but you have not had a single debate, effective debate on PAROs. Um, so, PAROs is not going to go anywhere very far. Meanwhile, you also have the Russia and China have proposed a draft treaty on the prevention of the placement of weapons in outer space. Uh, first proposed in 2008, then they uh, renewed, uh, and they came out with a new text in 2014, um, but has not had much of a traction. You also in between had the European Union initiated uh, code of conduct for outer space activities. It ran into problem mainly because most countries were not part of the process involved in creating that document and therefore, countries were like why should I sign on to something that somebody else has created. So, I think that is where the processes that are also as important as the final document that you might come up with and therefore, if uh, tomorrow if the EU were to engage in a new exercise of that kind, I would say at least start engaging all the space faring, uh, space agencies for instance in many of the forums. Um, and so that you can actually build that support base across the board rather than you know have something come up and the rest of us will be sitting and asking who do you think, why do you think the EU knows what is best for the rest of the world, mm -hmm. we do not ask such, uh, such kind, kind of questions. Mm -hmm. uh, because the code of conduct itself, the document itself was not too bad actually and, uh, and India's own position on the code of conduct and the general debates have uh, progressed quite a bit uh, from uh, insisting that we will only go for legally binding verification measures and so on and so forth. We have moved to a somewhat of more of a middle path to say that we could possibly start with a transparency and confidence building measure in the initial stage mm -hmm. and gradually work towards an outer space treaty, uh, uh, treaty like mechanism. Um, so, that is a I think pragmatic uh, uh, appreciation because the say space security concerns are becoming a lot more challenging. So, if you have to be able to uh, have safe, secure and sustainable use of outer space into the future, we need to do something and that therefore, the pragmatic sense of 
maybe we need to start with the TCBM like political instrument and then gradually work the con uh, work the work the uh, relationships build greater confidence build greater, uh, better transparency measures between countries so that we are not going to end up in a in a you know war fighting kind of a mechanism but many other countries are going down that path because we do not have an agreement most recently uh, space, uh, France came out with a military space strategy uh, just a few weeks ago you had the J uh, Japanese government uh, news reports saying that they are going to be uh, developing certain interceptor capability in the next few years time because they may asking for budget allocation. So, more and more countries are going down the path of space in from a purely national security domain. India is a leading player in the space domain uh, and, and therefore do you think India has invested enough uh, in the ongoing negotiations about some of these aspects? Is, is it enthusiastic and energetic enough uh, given that it is a leading player? Yeah, so area? we were part of the 2018-19 uh, uh, GG, UN GG on Paros. We were uh, fairly active within that group and uh, uh, we have a stake, like I said, financially and otherwise a stake in what happens there because uh, we do not want global rules to be written by somebody based on their sets of concern. We want to take an active role. We want it to be an inclusive process. So, and uh, this is something an inclusive process so that you can build a greater support base. It may not be the most ideal uh, instrument at the end of the day, but if you are able to build a large support base in the initial stage itself, I think that can kind of and I think that's been broadly now the Indian approach as well. So, India has uh, an important stakeholdership in, in what the how the global uh, rules are written. Um, but I think India is also further thinking along for putting up its own initiative, new initiatives and kind of thing and that is something I think uh, the government and the various stakeholders are also talking about in a sense. India recently set up this defense space agency and, and a lot of people including yourself have been making this argument for a full fledged aerospace command which many countries in the world have uh, set up. How does that help? Uh, what is the objective behind it? I and the why the is defense space defense agency not adequate sufficient enough? I think the first and foremost is the uh, fuller integration of the civil and uh, security um, establishment. Mm. You have to have better integration between Department of Space, Ministry of Defense, um, and the military. Military again, you have the integrated space cell, um, which uh, which has been a good step taken <coughs> sometime in two thousand eight. Uh, right after the Chinese uh, anti-satellite test, but I think that was the first baby step that was required, but we have not made huge progress in terms of building true integration of um, uh, objectives, capabilities, all of that among these three or four uh, major different agencies that are involved. So, I think the idea of having and second aspect is that I think it is high time we came out with the military space policy itself. We have not even, we do not even have an a regular or general open space policy. We do not have a policy in the open domain for instance. Uh, we have some sector specific policies like the, for the remote sensing and satellite communication SATCOM policy, but I think even those are not, not been particularly useful, but I think the need for an open space policy is very real because it is also a message, a, a tool for messaging both to your friends as well as to your adversaries in a sense. But I would go a step further to say that you need to have a military space policy, you need to have a military space uh, f um, thing completely separated from civil space cooperation because ISRO is always going to be uh, there because they do have a lot more international partnerships, collaboration agreements and so on and so forth. So, therefore, they would be constrained in how much they want, what kind of capabilities that they want to develop and so on and so forth. Uh, but at the same time, given the growing security related requirements in terms of dedicated satellites for the Army, and Air Force and Navy, we need to have a separate arm for military space capabilities. And a lot of, lot of other countries are doing precisely that. So, absolutely. And of course, the Space Force of the US has gained a lot more uh, uh, headlines in recent months, but I think uh, much before that you had the Chinese and the Russians developing such uh, uh, specialized forces uh, for the security related functions of space. But, but the absence of an aerospace command in India is not um, a, a sui generis issue in some ways because um, you also do not have other theater commands, right? The, 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 sure. So, the, the so, yeah, the, the requirement I think is very real and I think that is where uh, if for several years now this the demand has been in for the three tri-service commands. One is the um, defense uh, cyber agency now that has come to special yeah forces. special forces and the space agency. Uh, but the demand for this has been like decades old in a sense who have been talking about bring a, bringing greater integration because 
you also need to have better financial allocation at the end of the day for space. Uh, ISRO gets uh, something around 1.8 billion dollars uh, which is far too less and it is kind of spread out so thin to be effective in a sense today. They have done Im impressively uh, um, you know they have this is one of the rare public sector units that has done India proud there is no doubt on that and uh, kudos to ISRO for all their achievements. But I would say that you know they are still they can do a lot more if they want better financial allocation that is something that is much required. Second there is also a capacity deficit within ISRO. ISRO has to in that sense engage more with the private sector that is available within the country so you have a sizable talent within the country and you need to reach out to them. Uh, ISRO has begun to do this in the last few years because uh, purely in recognition of the capacity lack of capacity in house in a sense. So, they have reached out to uh, some of the companies that are some of the industries engaged in propulsion technology, some of the countries for some of the uh, entities for developing manufacturing satellites again because of the lack of in house capability. Uh, but I think that is something that has to speed up so that ISRO can focus on pure space exploration where some of the tried and tested programs like the PSLV polar satellite launch vehicle which is the considered as a workhorse of the ISRO which is a tried and tested program. You can palm it off to the industry to run it you do not need to run, run the routine missions. ISRO can focus on some of the bigger missions Gaganyaan is an imp important mission uh, because these are also important in the context of generating public uh, excitement. I can see the difference between uh, during Mangalyan mass mission in 2014-15 and now in terms of the public excitement, public yeah, yeah. engagement on the space program in a sense. Because you have done some of these big missions, it has excited the next generation of kids into space or larger science, STEM education and kind of things. So, a lot of things can be done to, but I think uh, better outreach can do a lot more um, in the space domain. But I, I, think, I think one thing that you uh, underlined in your um, um, in your interaction is that we need to have a unified coherent policy yeah. uh, and that needs to be put out in public yeah. uh, there is no need to shy away from that. Absolutely. In fact uh, there has been a policy in the making for a long time in fact it is gone around all the different institutions army, air force, navy and so on and so forth that every now and then I hear no no it is going to come out in the next two years next two years uh, and that does not happen meanwhile the uh, we came out with the uh, draft space dra draft bill. Uh, which is more geared towards the commercial aspects and so on and so forth. But I think that is also been seen as not adequate because you are still looking at outsourcing model. So, there have there are a few major industries that have been associated with the Indian space program like the Larsen and Tubro, Godrej, Walchand Nagar and so on and so forth. But they have a purely outsourcing model ok this is a capacity I do not have in house ok this is what I need you develop it for me. It is not a it is not a scenario where you create a level playing field for the private sector to invest in serious R&D and develop the capabilities, develop certain technology. So, that is the and I, I, I have the best example the NASA the US system is the best example in a sense US example provides just because they engage a whole range of private sector uh, industries NASA's importance has never diminished as a space program as a space agency exactly. So, that kind of confidence has to come and that kind of a uh, ecosystem has to be created so that um, you know you have a large number of players whom you can rely on whether it is your small and medium sized enterprises who might supply you with certain components and subsystems, but you also engage with the big and small across the board. Um, so, that ISRO can focus on some of the larger missions a lot of the other regular missions can be uh, done by the uh, other agencies and private sector in a sense. That is really wonderful talking to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Absolutely. To receive instant updates on all videos from The Wire, click the subscribe button and hit the bell icon. Pay to support independent journalism. Click the link in the description and choose the amount you want to pay.